and welcome to Addicted to Murder. This is Courtney, licensed professional counselor with over a decade of experience. And this is Trisha, and right before Courtney came over to record, I had a nice little voidy. Voidy? Yeah. Well, you were eating lunch when I got here, so I'm going to assume it was a quick meal? A quick bite to eat. Ah. Even though it's spelled like I peed or something, like voyed e. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) But no, yeah. Got some good Mexican food from the local place. Nice. Around town. Yep. Sounds a lot better than the frozen corn dog and potato chips I had for lunch. It's a lot of carbs, Mm. which aren't bad. It's true. It's just, no, there is no foliage in there. No. I didn't have much foliage in mine either. There was some pico de gallo and a little lettuce, but nothing to really speak of. Yeah. I don't think ketchup counts. I don't know. Hmm. I mean, it's tomatoes, sugar, and fruit flies. Fruit flies? That's what I've heard. I've heard that like ketchup has like the way that they make it just has like tons of fruit flies in it. So I guess there's protein in there if that's true. I mean, there was protein in the corn dog. That, yeah, a little mm. bit of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I still eat ketchup, but that's just, I mean, I, I, I mean, never it makes that. sense. Like if you, you know, it's fruit or bugs, probably all gets into that however they mm. make it. Yeah, you know? well. Yeah. If I can't see it, it doesn't bother me. Right. In the same way, I don't really want to know how my food's made. Mm. You know, like mm-hmm. I, I do make a lot of my own food because I try to be as organic as I can, which it's hard to do because it's expensive. But if I'm going out to eat or something like that, I'm just I'm not going to question it. Right. Because that would just, no. Yeah. So. Makes sense. Anyways, we are back after a week break. Yes. Thank um, you for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney and I have been trying to balance our school life. And sometimes it's easier than others. Yes. Um, you know, what is like almost the hardest part now is I used to be like two or three books ahead. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, even if I couldn't write my questions in time, like I was still versed in the, you know, case. So right. To speak. And now like I'm, I'm, I've ordered my next book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not here yet. So, oh, and um, no, I'll, I'm going to save my clue for one. Never mind. I'm just going to give out a clue. But oh. anyways, um. Before we start about our new our new case, Courtney, I have a question for you, as it is my question. All right. What would you do tomorrow if you won a million dollars today? Um, I would pay off my student loans mm. immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Get that just done and over with. We have a medical student right now. Sometimes we have medical student interns, and she was telling me, like, how much her student loans were, and I couldn't believe it. It's pretty insane. I was, and she's not done. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I mean, I'm talking, like, near half a million dollars. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. I mean, I know I have a pretty decent balance, but it's not that bad. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I'm assuming when you're doing medical school, you can't, like, really have a job. Right. So then you're taking out loans to live on mm-hmm. as well as to go to school, which is also very expensive. Right. So that's mm-hmm. probably why it gets so high. Makes sense. Um, and then it is, you know, a lot of schooling on right. top of it. So, and then depending on, you know, private university or public university, all of those things. All the things, yeah. But I was just like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> it made my student loan pile look like a mere pittance. Right. What would you do? Um, well... Just a million dollars. I guess I wouldn't really need a lawyer to figure my shit out because, you know, it's not – after that, it's not that much money. Um, I would – I would want to buy – okay, so I love my lottery dream home on mm-hmm. HGTV with David, and I would um, want to buy a second house somewhere, and I would really want David to help me do so because he is so fabulous. Oh. I love him. <laughs> I love his clothes and everything, like – and he's just so happy all the time. He does quite flamboyant. Yes, but in such a good, positive way. So I, I would definitely want to get a second home somewhere, mm. like a vacation home. Got it. I mean, and pay off any debt that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, nothing like crazy. I wouldn't go buy a bunch of cars or anything like that. Yeah, I would maybe buy a car because my car is sort of on its, its last legs. It's true. But I needs a new car. I do. But you know. But I'm also paying for school right now, so hopefully my car can last another two and a half years. That's true. Here's to that for you. (laughs) Yes, thank you. Anyways, okay, well, um, 
Oh, yeah, it's my case. So I'm going to just jump right into it. So we are going to do, this is my first female that I've covered. The other yeah. females have been yours. Juana? No, you did. Oh, uh, did Diane. Diane, Diane Downs. She wasn't a serial killer. Right. So um, mm-hmm. I'm doing Eileen Warnos. Dun, so dun, dun. Um, I think she was the damsel of death, I think, is one of the monikers I saw for her. Yeah. I think most people know her from the movie with Shirley's Theron. Yeah. Monster. Yeah. Well, that's the name of the book that she wrote. I mean, it says it's uh, – she, she co-wrote it. So it is it is called Monster, My True Story by Eileen Warnos with Christopher Barry D. So I imagine that was like her ghostwriter or whoever collaborator. Um, so anyways, I chose her because, well, there aren't a whole lot of female serial killers out there. Um, and it is a really sad – it's a really sad story. It is. And I didn't know who she was till that movie. So obviously that did something um, for her. She's no longer around to see it. So I don't know how she felt about the portrayal. Because Charlize Theron looked just like her. That yes. was crazy makeup. Yes. Whoever did like makeup and wardrobe and stuff mm-hmm. was like a genius. And I mean, I didn't know Eileen in real life. But the mannerisms she used most likely were like mimicking how Eileen was because it was like she was in a she was totally I think she won an Oscar for that she did she did great in there it's she looks I mean she's so beautiful and so to see her trans not saying that Eileen wasn't wasn't beautiful but the transformation like you couldn't tell it was her really Mm -hmm. not not really right so anyways I recommend anyone who hasn't seen that to go see it it was a good movie based on this book and I mean they do take some liberties but it, it seems kind of true form but we are going to start. So um, I just said that part. Um, oh, yeah. So, again, because this book was written by Eileen, there's probably going to be some untruths, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. But we're just going to go along with what she says and, you know, present it that way. So Eileen Carol Pittman was born in Detroit, Michigan on Leap Day in the year 1956 to her 14-year-old mother, some people say 16 Diane Diane Warnos. Her father is described as a 19-year-old child molester named Leo Dale Pittman. Diane and Leo were married, and it's speculated that Diane lied about her age to do so. Their marriage only lasted a short time before Leo split, leaving Diane alone with Eileen and her older brother Keith. Eileen would go by Lee, but I'm going to use Eileen since that's how she's more known in the media. Eileen never knew her father as he was jailed for kidnapping and raping a 17-year-old girl. I guess there's some evidence linking him to the murder of another young girl as well. He spent some time in secure mental institutions before hanging himself in 1971 with the bedsheet. Diane, Eileen's mom, could not take care of her children. And when Eileen was only four years old, her mom took her and Keith to their grandparents' house to babysit. And then she left. And she left them there. Didn't come back. So, Courtney, to say that Eileen is starting life in a shitty fashion is a bit of an understatement. Please comment away on any of these things um, and, like, what they can do to a child. It looks like she would have been about 15 when her father killed herself, killed himself. So the word that comes to mind most is abandonment. You know, Eileen was abandoned by her father when he left the family, and then she was abandoned again by her mother, and then finally abandoned again by her father when he died by suicide. So, you know, when she was very young, separation from parents would have caused probably an attachment wound, um, you know, impacting her ability to form stable connections with caregivers and peers. And then also when parents leave, children often blame themselves and believe that either they did something wrong to drive their parents away Or that there is just something about them that makes them unlovable, and that's why their parent left. Abandonment, abandonment, abandonment. We know what that one links to. Or if you forgot which personality disorder that links to, we will explore it later on. Yes, we will. Yes. In March of 1960, Lori and Eileen, Eileen's grandparents adopted her and her brother. So, um, okay, so grandpa's name is Lori. And grandma's name is Eileen. They're spelt differently, but you can't see that. Um, So anyways, those are the grandparents. And they legally adopted Eileen and her brother, Keith. 
So they already had other children because remember, Diane was really young when she had her kids. So the house included both Keith and Eileen, as well as their aunts and uncles, Barry and Lori. So another Lori, because they just named themselves after each other, but slightly skew the spelling each time. So Courtney, it wasn't long before Eileen took what she says was an unhealthy interest in matches. In fact, on one occasion, she got pretty bad facial burns from using lighter fluid to start her fire. Now, it's been a while since we talked about this fire fascination and what it can lead to. She was only six when she did this. Just kind of got us through it, please. So some interest in fire and how it works is totally normal for kids. But the intensity of Eileen's fascination as a six-year-old is pretty unusual. You know, fire setting behavior in childhood is recognized as one of the, quote, dark triad behaviors that can predict violent behavior in the future, along with wetting the bed and abusing animals. And left unchecked, fascination with fire can develop into pyromania, which is an impulse control disorder in which a person feels a very strong and compulsive urge to set fires. If you had a six-year-old come in and parents are like we can't get her to leave fire alone how do you even like what's the course of therapy that first comes to your mind to treat that in a kid well I imagine that wouldn't be the only behavior that they would be coming in for Mm -hmm. um but I think the biggest thing would be about teaching fire safety Mm. right like okay so you're interested in fire this is how you can do it safely with supervision that kind of thing a lot of times they're fire setting isn't wanting to hurt anyone it's just right they just they want to play with it yeah exactly now I'm unsure how you know children's memories totally work at this age but I guess even though Eileen was four when her mom left she thought her grandparents were in fact her parents and they didn't tell her otherwise her grandfather was physically intimidating and a heavy drinker Eileen claims that he had a belt that he would beat her with. He would make her take her pants and underwear off and beat her while saying things like she was worthless, she wasn't worthy of the air she was breathing, and that she should have never been born. One of Eileen's friends recalled later in life that she would always have bruises all over her arms, her chin, and her cheeks. This friend also claims that it was no secret to anyone that Eileen and her own brother Keith were in a sexual relationship with each other. Eileen did confirm this, but she did not specify how old she was when she was in this type of relationship with her brother. But Eileen started to be fully sexually active when she was only nine years old. Courtney, you know what I'm going to ask? Grandparents making her think they are her parents. Grandfather slash father beating her and calling her worthless, leaving bruises all over her. And an incestuous relationship with her brother. Let's hear it. Well, there are, of course, the parallels to other killers, like Ted Bundy, and our most recent killer, Stuart Northcott. Um, But beyond that, I do think it matters that Eileen is female in this situation. You know, during the 1960s, when she was growing up, there were still very traditional expectations around gender roles and power. And so as a young girl, already being abandoned... She was then brutalized by her grandfather and told repeatedly how worthless she was. And then I want to be very clear that any sexual contact between Eileen and her brother as children was not a consensual relationship. It was a result of sexual abuse, and it was sexual abuse. You know, somebody, I would guess either their biological father or grandfather, likely molested one or both of them, or may have encouraged the sexual behavior between them because kids just don't start having sex with each other out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, through all of this, Eileen seemed to realize very early that the only thing that others found valuable about her was her body and sex. Yeah, we'll definitely see that. Okay, Courtney, now this is sad. One of Eileen's classmates told of a time that there was a bunch of kids hanging out at this place that they called, quote, the pits. And here's a quote. One time she was dumped from a moving van, fell badly on her head, and no one attempted to help her. I guess no one liked her that much, end quote. So I'm I'm feeling so bad for this wayward girl. I mean, look, all she is, she's doing all this to survive, to get her needs met. And she seems to have absolutely no support. I mean, she's dumped from a moving vehicle and no one checks to see if she's okay. Well, it gets worse as far as her social standing goes. 
she would go to these gatherings and be kind of on the fringes watching all her teenage classmates hook up and do what kids do, you know, like snog as Harry Potter calls it. No one wanted to kiss her, but they would pay for sexual favors for her in exchange for cigarettes. So she would do these things, I'm assuming kind of just to have some sort of connection with people, but it earned her the nickname of Cigarette Pig or Cigarette Bandit. Mm. Yeah. Eileen and a friend, I mean, I guess she must have had some friends, um, set off some sort of explosion one time that resulted in her getting more facial scars and burn scars on her arms. She had to be hospitalized for many days and then had to be confined for months. So she'd have these scars until she died. I'm hoping that she got over her fire fetish after this. She has now burnt herself pretty badly twice. So she's not a very good pyro. Courtney, do you know if they grow out of a fire fetish? So most people don't outgrow fetishes, um, but they do tend to sort of refine them and they become more specific over time. So if Eileen did continue to be excited by fire as she matured and had even slightly better handle on her impulse control, um, she could have found safer or at least more controlled ways to express this. Well, Eileen found out that her parents were really grand, excuse me, were really her grandparents at about age 11. Eileen was already kind of wild, going with a crazy temper, and this just pushed her even further down that path. She felt totally deceived. She got worse. She was so angry, angry at the man who had been abusing her for years and who had now been found to be lying to her too. Quote, she would take out her hatred for him on many of the men she would meet in the future, and she had an excellent tool at her disposal. Disposal, Sex. Courtney? When she learned this information, <clears throat> I imagine that it brought up a whole new wave of that feeling of abandoned abandonment that she probably already had, and now also add betrayal on top of that. And I just, I can't imagine walking around with the level of anger and rage and hurt that she just must have felt all the time. Mm -hmm. Eileen and her grandfather continued to clash, and he kicked her out often. One time she slept in the woods in the snow for two days before going back. Another time she slept in cars. Eventually she ran away on her own with her friend Dawn. They hitchhiked all the way to California. Dawn actually stayed in contact with Eileen until the end. By this time, Eileen was into drugs, and it didn't really seem to matter what they were. She had a lot to forget. Eileen also started to drink heavily at age 12. Of course, she was taken advantage of when she would pass out at parties, waking up to find semen on her clothes or hearing later that people watched as multiple males assaulted the sleeping Eileen. Hey, Courtney, it gets worse for Eileen. By age 14, she was doing poorly in school. Shocker, right? I guess she was dissociating a lot. I would be too if I had her life. Anyways, she wasn't done lighting fires. She didn't learn. She lit a toilet paper roll on fire in one of the girls' bathrooms. This definitely got the school's attention, and they strongly suggested that she get counseling. But her adoptive parents didn't do anything. She did not get the help that she so desperately needed. She didn't get therapy. But she did get pregnant. Some say it was her brother's baby, and some say it was her grandfather's. She went to an unmarried mother's home to wait for the baby to be born. She didn't get along with the staff or the girls there. But she eventually did give birth to a baby that was put up for adoption. No one knows what happened to that baby to this day. Courtney, let's talk about diagnosis. Have you ever had a kiddo with this much shit going on? You know, I've worked with some very traumatized children, but the extent of Eileen's trauma goes far beyond anything that I have seen personally. And if she had come through my therapy office as a teen... I would probably have diagnosed her with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, technically, complex PTSD is not in the DSM-5, um, but it is colloquially used um, by therapists to describe trauma that is prolonged, repetitive, and multifaceted. And if anyone's history has ever fit this description, Eileen's did. And I also would have to consider some kind of conduct disorder. Um, because she is fire setting, there's drug and alcohol use, there's school failure, and, you know, running away. So Eileen having a baby so young really did a number on her grandfather. He was very much ashamed of the whole situation. Sh excuse me, situation. He threatened to kill both Keith and Eileen if they ever, oh, sorry. 
He threatened to kill both Keith and Eileen if they did not get out of his house. It was that same year that Eileen's grandmother died. The book says, quote, under somewhat sinister circumstances, meaning Eileen's grandmother's died and it was, um, I don't know, they made it sound mysterious. Mm, suspicious, perhaps. Yeah. Regardless, I guess this sent Grandpa over the edge. He attempted suicide by electric- electrocution by filling his basement with water, standing in it, and then turning the power on. This attempt did not work, but he did successfully complete suicide a couple years later by gassing himself in the garage. Eileen found his body and said the only thing she did at his funeral was blow cigarette smoke into his face. Courtney? The amount of loss Eileen experienced is just extraordinary. She already lost a set of parents by the age of four when they just left her. Now she's lost a second set of parents, even if she did have very strong negative feelings about her grandfather. Plus, she gave her own child up for adoption. And even when birth mothers make this choice willingly, like they know it's the right thing, um, there can be so many conflicting emotions, including things like grief and guilt and sadness. Well, after the death of her grandfather, her mom, her bio mom, actually reached out to her and offered you know, her and Keith a place to stay. Eileen declined and set out on the road. So the book really outlines nicely how this is how this probably looked. Quote, Lee had all the necessary skills required of the profession that was beckoning. She had good looks, a tough spirit, a neat figure, a cheeky smile, the morals of an alley cat, and a strong right hook. She knew what men wanted from her, and she would do well out of any gullible guy who crossed her path. Her mind, however, was brooding and silent, a dormant volcano building up to an eruption. End quote. In 1974, when Eileen was 18, she was arrested for drunk driving, disorderly conduct, and firing a gun from a moving vehicle. Courtney, do you think we're in the antisocial realm yet? Yes, I think that we are. You know, I mentioned conduct disorder earlier as a potential diagnosis for her younger teen years, and the only real difference between conduct disorder and antisocial personality disorder is age. Mm -hmm. You have to be 18 to be diagnosed with a personality disorder. Her luck turned around, some might say, when she was 20. In 1976, in some crazy twist of fate, Eileen married a 69-year-old multimillionaire by the name of Lewis. He picked her up hitchhiking one day when she stole his wallet. He didn't discover this until he dropped her off. Somehow, the pair met back up, and he was smitten or something with her. Perhaps she had sex with him, and it had been a while for him. Whatever the reason, he proposed with a very big ring, and she accepted right away. They got married in Kingsley, Georgia. Eileen sent newspaper clippings back to people in Michigan showing that she married a rich man. I guess it was kind of like a fuck you to all the people who treated her like trash. When Lewis married Eileen, he was hoping for a pretty young thing to satisfy him and stay home and keep house. That was not Eileen. One evening, she went over Lewis's protestations and ended up in a nightclub where she started to hustle on the pool table. She got drunk. She got rowdy, she was threatening other patrons, and eventually she was asked to leave. This pissed Eileen off, so she picked up a pool ball and hauled it at the patron's head, missing him by just inches. She threw the ball so hard that it lodged into the wall behind him. She was arrested for assault and battery and taken to jail. She also had outstanding warrants from her hometown, so they added that to her arrest. A few days later, her brother Keith died of throat cancer, and he was only 21. Courtney? Eileen learned how to survive from a young age in the tough neighborhoods of Detroit with no money and no security. And so taking her out of that environment and transplanting her into the world of a millionaire and expecting her to just adapt to being a housewife was really an exercise in futility. You know, 20 years of developing neural pathways in the brain for survival um, and trauma you know, set her up to basically require chaos in order to feel normal. And then, you know, take all of that and add another potentially devastating loss of losing her brother. Um, I, you, I know you don't like the term daddy issues. Um, <laughs> do you think that, I know you don't, you, this is totally speculation based on what you know of Eileen. Do you think that her marrying this guy was for the money because he was a father-type figure? Both? Neither? I would probably say both. 
I think that she, you know, clearly was looking for some financial security. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, you know, I think everyone wants someone to take care of them. Mm -hmm. And if that was part of what Lewis was offering, you know, someone who just wants to be loved. Because he was a lot older than her. He was, Yeah. yeah. So kind of filled that void a little bit. Well, I'm assuming that everyone can guess that their marriage didn't last long. Eileen could not stand being home doing what she considered boring things. If she had ASPD, then we know that they get bored easily. They need to be doing things, oftentimes illegal things, to get the feelings that they crave. When Lewis tried to rein her in, telling her what to do, she punched him in the face and gave him a black eye. After this tactic did not work, he tried to take her allowance away and make her make her obey him that way. I guess he got just a few words out of his mouth regarding this when she picked up his walker and beat him with it, just before she held a meat skewer to his throat. So that honeymoon was over. Lewis got a restraining order and an annulment. Eileen pawned her giant ring, and they went their separate ways. Courtney? So this is a good example of the concept of homeostasis that exists in all of nature, including humans. We get used to functioning a certain way because that is what's necessary to survive in our environment. So even if it's chaotic and terrible, it is at least familiar. So then when the environment changes, even if it changes for the better... We have a hard time adjusting and changing the way we function because it feels uncomfortable and unnatural. As a result, sometimes people take a good situation and try and create chaos unconsciously because it's all they know how to do. And I think that was Eileen. I wonder if like later on in life she thought back to when she was married to Lewis and was like, shit. Yeah, like that was a good thing. <laughs> yeah, like it was so easy because it only gets harder for her um but yeah that's that's where we're going to stop for the day so let's just recap a little bit parents who abandoned her her dad her bio dad was like a convicted raping child molester Mm -hmm. i mean right there um grandparents who lied to her then you know, mistreated her, then passed away. Friends, so-called friends, who used her for sex and paid her in cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Fire setting. um, A brother that she may have had an incestuous relationship with that may have made a baby. um, And... Losing that baby. Losing that baby, losing her brother, being married and divorced. Uh, very domestic violent type situation on her on her mm-hmm. end. I mean, it's just a lot. And she's only 20. She's only 20. Yeah. Yeah. She's, and that's what's, what's so shocking is she went through all of this before she could even like legally drink. Right. Although back then maybe she could have. That's but true. in today, in yes. today she wouldn't be able to legally drink. <laughs> right. But back then, who knows? Mm-hmm. So anyways, food for thought, munch on that. We will pick up next week. And it, it, this is just a two-parter, so. All right. Hang in there. All right. Thank you and be safe. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye.